Good morning, Rocky Peak. <laughs> so great to see you and uh, welcome. You know, whether you're here in the worship center, you're out joining us on the patio. Uh, so good to be with you. I, I tell you, uh, I just want to second what um, what Johnny was saying. You know, I was down there uh, for the first couple songs of worship. And uh, it's just so great to be worshiping with you today, wasn't it? It was just so good to be in the Lord's presence. And uh, I just want to give a shout out. You know, Scripture says, give honor to whom honor is due. And uh, I am just so thankful for our kind of the, the person who, who leads our whole worship ministry, Lauren Laporta, Claude Pelter. And uh, she has just continued to, to not only build the team, but build a team that, that really together understands our whole philosophy of worship, right? It's, it's not about performance. It's about coming into the presence of God. And that takes not only uh, great leadership, it takes a great team to understand that. And uh, I am so thankful. I always feel like there's no, no place I'd rather be worshiping than here with uh, our church. So um, just a shout out to her. But we are going to go into our time of uh, teaching right now. And so, as Johnny said, uh, you, if you don't have your note sheet ready, you'll, you'll definitely need that. But if you guys are ready to go, I'm ready to jump in. You guys ready to go? Okay. Well, Father, we're just thankful to be here in your house on this beautiful day. And, and under the leadership, Lord, we just, we just acknowledge you as our king, uh, that as we're going to be learning today, we have one Lord. And uh, we, all, we all bow the knee. We all salute to you as our leader. And so today as we come, Lord, and we, we look at your priority, our leader's priority for our life, uh, we pray, Lord, that you'd give us the grace and the humility and the wisdom to bow the knee to you and to grow uh, in our surrender to your leadership and what's most important in your heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Well, our story uh, starts today in really one of the largest cities of the world, and uh, th this is not where he grew up. It's not where he was born. Um, but it's where he moved a few years ago. And, uh, and it's been a great move for him. He's, uh, he's built relationships. Um, his venture has gone well. And, uh, and, and, and he just, he's happy here. Uh, but on this particular day, he gets word that some, some friends from another time and another place are in town from a long distance away, and uh, he's looking forward to seeing them, he's catching up. And so they, they get together for dinner, and it's just so good, um, just so good getting reunited with one another and sharing and, and what's happening in their lives. Uh, but there's one piece of information, one report that they bring that is deeply distressing. It's about some mutual friends, friends they have in common uh, from another time, another place, long, long way away, that are going through a major crisis. And, um, and so as he gets the details and learns all about this, his, his heart is heavy. And so when, when they leave, he's, he's just pondering what to do. I mean, if it was possible, he, he would love to drop everything and go back and help him sort out this crisis. But he knows that that's not really an option right now. And so as he, as he goes to sleep this night, he, uh, he just has a feeling that, that tonight he's not going to get a lot of sleep. Uh, he's waiting for, like, what's the right thing to do? Well, today we are continuing the series we started just a couple weeks ago that's called Christ, Culture, and the Church. And for those of you who are new, and I know every week we have new people. It was just so fun last night meeting our Next Step Dessert, some of the people that God's bringing to Rocky Peak. But... Uh, if you're new, th this is an in-depth series of, of a kind of study of one of Paul's letters, the Apostle Paul's letters to, uh, to a church that he'd actually started three years prior uh, in the southern tip of modern-day Greece. It was in a very important strategic city, uh, one of the most important cities in the Roman Empire called Corinth. And, uh, and so he, he's writing this letter to them that we, we call it 1 Corinthians. Now, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, you know that we've, we, the last couple of weeks as we've jumped in this series, we, the first week we did kind of a, a look at the backstory of the, the city of Corinth, um, the, the culture there, uh, the church, how it was started. And then last week, we actually dived into the letter for the very first time, and we began to unpack this powerful introduction where Paul reminds them who they are and what God, what God did when he, first, uh, when, when he first came to the city, when Paul first came. 
and also begins to lay a strategic groundwork, kind of subtly introducing some of the topics that he wants to address in this long letter. Uh, and so today we're ready to jump in now to the very first issue, kind of top, top issue uh, that he needs to tackle. And so there in your note sheet, you have a section called Christ, uh, Culture, and the Church, Conflict in Corinth. And if you have your Bibles or apps, go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. We're going to cover verses 10 through 17 today. But before we jump into the passage, I, I want to set the stage, just remind you where we've been. So what we've seen the last couple of weeks is that when the Apostle Paul first came to Corinth with this radical message that a crucified Jew was actually king of creation, that, that God worked in a supernatural way, and in spite of how offensive or crazy the message seemed, that, that many people came to Christ, they had a powerful uh, uh, experience of the Holy Spirit, uh, that God actually poured out a wide array of powerful uh, spiritual gifts, especially speaking gifts, gifts of tongues, interpretation, prophecy, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, uh, confirming the message that, that Paul had brought about Jesus. And then Paul and his team stayed there longer than any other place so far. They stayed there a year and a half helping this young church to get started. So they got off to this great start. But, but what we saw is that after... Um, that, that uh, after Paul left, that this church began to drift, and it became increasingly influenced more by the ways of its culture than the ways of Christ. And as a result, it's led to a lot of conflict, to uh, chaos, confusion. And so, so Paul is going to have to tackle all these issues in this letter. And today we come to the very first issue, which has to do with divisions in the church. Uh, almost think of it like like church splits, or, or maybe what happens in a church before there's an actual split, but there's, there's different segments beginning to form. And so we're going to pick it up here at verse 10 and uh, see what happens. So 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, uh, Paul says, uh, I appeal to you, brothers. And so this is a very strong word in the Greek. We'll see it later today. Sometimes it's translated appeal. Other times it's translated I urge, or I've even seen I beg. Um, so it's, 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 he's jumping into the deep end with them. And he says, I, I appeal or urge to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's in the name of Jesus. Like this, what he's about to charge him with is serious. And he says that you all agree with one another in what you say, that there be no divisions, uh, kind of splits. The word in Greek is schisma, where we get our word schisms from that there would be no divisions or schisms among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Now, as we'll see later, pa Paul does not mean that he wants him to agree on every little issue. We'll see this later on when we get to chapters 8 through 10. There's actually some really big disagreements in the church over what we would describe today as secondary issues, really important issues, but, but not core to your salvation or, or living out your faith. And so, so he's not saying that we're going to agree on everything, but, but he needs to, both of us to remember who we are as followers of Jesus and protect the unity of the body. And so, uh, and so he goes on and he's, he's going to give them a little bit more information about what he's talking about now. He says, so my brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household. So notice he assumes that they know who Chloe is. Uh, and we'll talk about that. They've informed me that there are quarrels uh, or these dissensions, these splits among you. So, uh, so let's set this up. So uh, this takes us back to the story that we started the day with. You know, we started the day with this story about this man who has moved to a major, one of the largest cities uh, in his world. Um, he's, he didn't grow up there, but he's been here the last two or three years. Um, he's done well. His venture has gone well. Uh, but recently, he's entertained some, some guest visitors from another time, another place, uh, some old friends that have shared with them a crisis brewing with, with some mutual friends, and he's not sure what to do. So this is my version of this verse, all right? So, so what happened is that after Paul left Corinth, he's there a year and a half, he eventually is gonna to return to Ephesus. So if you remember the map from the first week, or you can picture it in your mind, you know, uh, Corinth is in, is in the very southern tip of uh, Greece. But if you were to go across the, uh, straight across the Aegean uh, Sea, go move to the east, you would come to modern day Turkey, and right there on the coast was the city of Ephesus, which was the fourth 
largest city in the Roman Empire. Extremely important. Paul has, has recently, he's, he's been there now for a couple of years. He shared Jesus. A lot of great things are happening. But what happens about two years in, he's going to get a visit from these people that he describes as from Chloe's household. So who is Chloe? Well, we don't know for sure, but the way he talks about her and the report that, 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 that he's going to get, it suggests that Chloe was probably a member of the church of Corinth. Um, she, she's a woman. Uh, it seems like she's fairly successful. She has uh, apparently not married for whatever reason. Um, and it's from her household, which would, be, which would take in both relatives, uh, but also a very likely slaves or servants, this kind of larger household. And so what's happened is that for whatever reason, people from Chloe's household have traveled this 350 miles across the Aegean Sea. They've come to Ephesus, very likely on business. We're not really sure. But uh, sure enough, they're, they're going to connect with the Apostle Paul, right? They're going to take this opportunity. But when they get there, I'm sure they have a long conversation. But one of the things they're going to share is very distressing. That there are these, that, that back in Corinth, these, these divisions are developing. So let's see, see what he's talking about. So he says, uh, verse 11, my brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. And what I mean is that one of you says, I follow Paul. Now, in the Greek, what it literally says is, I am of Paul. In other words, like, I, I'm a Paul man. You know, like, I, 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 I want, I'm with his team. I'm, I'm with team Paul, right? And, and the other one says, I'm of Apollos. So Apollos was a very gifted teacher in the early church. After Paul had left Corinth, uh, he had actually come and been there and, and, and made a major impact. He and Paul were friends. They were on good terms. Um, but but there, there's another group saying, I'm of Apollos. I'm on team Apollos. Uh, another said, I'm, of, uh, I'm on team Cephas. So Cephas is the Aramaic name for Peter, the apostle Peter. So we don't know if he's recently been there or there's just kind of people uh, kind of following the, kind of the, uh, more of a Jewish flavor of, uh, of their, their faith. Uh, or still another, I'm of Christ. You know, I trump you all, I follow Jesus. And we're not really sure exactly wh you know, what that party was about. So, so what you have is you have a church that's breaking into kind of division or teams. And, and so the question is, well, why are they doing that? Like, why are they dividing? And the answer is we don't know for sure. Like, we don't know if it's, if it's the content of their teaching that was kind of, they were drawn to one more than the other, or whether it was their style of teaching, their rhetoric, their public speaking abilities. We're not really sure, but here's what we're gonna see. This issue that Paul is raising here is gonna dominate the next four chapters. And so we're gonna learn a lot about Corinth and a lot about what's going on that seems to be behind this split. And what we're gonna see is that in Corinth, as I shared the very first week, they were into wisdom and they were into public speaking, what we call rhetoric, trained rhetoricians or very popular form of entertainment. And uh, there were certain rules of, of speech and, and, and they would kind of grade their public speakers and they were very popular. So we, we know they're into wisdom, we know they're into knowledge, we, we know they're into these deep kind of spiritual experiences with the Holy Spirit, the spiritual gifts, uh, and they're into rhetoric. And what we're gonna see as we go through this is, is that they're, they, they seem to be splitting up into different teams, uh, almost like they would split up in the old days before they knew Jesus, uh, following their favorite philosophers. You know, like, well, I'm of the cynics. You know, I'm of the stoics. Uh, I'm of the Epicureans. And so it's almost like they've come to Jesus, but they don't really understand what it means to be a church. It's almost like they're looking at this like they would look at their old culture. And of course, the reason they're doing this, as we'll see later, is the reason they're dividing is because they have to show how smart they are, right? That the reason, like, I think, you know, I, I think that uh, Apollos is the best, and, and he's the best, and he's the wisest, and he's the most mature, and he's the most spiritual. So I'm on his team, because I need to show that I, I, I wear his brand, you know, that I'm part of that. I'm better than you all, uh, because you don't get it. You know, you follow Peter, you follow Paul, but for, for those who are truly spiritual, we follow Apollo. So underneath this split, as we're gonna see, is, is this arrogance and this dissension and, and really kind of measuring spirituality by the yardstick or the ruler of their culture, uh, as we saw last week. 
And so Paul is appalled, no pun intended, but he is appalled by this. This is like crazy. Uh, this is like tearing the body of Christ apart. So, you know, when we get to chapter 12, Paul's going to say, we are the body of Christ. Like, he's our head, and, and, and we're the different pieces. You know, one's an arm, one's a leg, one's an eye, one's an ear. Uh, and we all, play, we all play a different role. And so, so as they're splitting over leaders, it's almost like they're tearing the body of Christ apart. And so he's going to be asking... Uh, he's going to be asking some strong rhetorical questions to help to reorient them to Jesus and the reality of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So he says in verse 13, he says, is Christ divided? Like, are are you tearing up the body of Christ? Uh, Was Paul crucified for you? Remember, this is what unites us, the crucifixion. Like, like, I, I wasn't, you, know, you don't follow me, we follow Jesus. We don't follow Apollos, we follow Jesus. He'll say later in these opening chapters, hey, we're just servants. We're like servants of the king. And that's how you should look at us. And you may have that we may be good servants or bad servants, but we're just servants. It's about Jesus. Right? And then he'll come back and, and he'll say, the, the third, uh, third question is, uh, were you baptized in the name of Paul? So I've, I've, I've shared this before, but for those of you who are new, that in the early church, that, that this is the way you said, I want to follow Jesus. Like many times today, we'll do it differently. Like, hey, if you want to follow Jesus, raise your hand, walk the aisle, pray the prayer, write in the connect card. But in the early church, if you follow, want to follow Jesus, the way you do that is you're, you're baptized. And when you're baptized, you're baptized into Jesus. Into, you're, you're baptized into him. You become part of him. And so... Uh, so in the early church, there were no unbaptized Christians. That would be an oxymoron. And so, so notice here, he, doesn't, he, he just assumes everyone's baptized. So he says, hey, where, where did you baptize you know, into the name of Paul? And, and so then he says, um, I thank my God. In verse 14, I thank God I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, two of the leaders. You know, he's like, I, I, I you know, didn't realize it becomes so important later on. He said, so no one of you can say you're baptized in my name like I was building up my own following. And then he's, remember, he's dictating this letter, and so he's like, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, another leader that we'll meet later in the book. But beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone. So his mind is already starting to go. In verse 17, <laughs> he, says, he says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And so here, it's not in any way is he denigrating baptism, but what he's saying is, well, see, is that it's, it's in the gospel, in the message of Jesus and his cross that, that God meets people, that God opens their eyes, that brings them into the kingdom. The baptism is a symbol of what has already happened, right? And, and so it's a very important symbol, but what's important is that conversion that happens based on the message of Christ and his cross um, and so it's not important like who baptizes you. What's important is who you're baptized into. And so Paul says, for he didn't send me to baptize, um, but to preach the gospel. And then catch this. This is sort of a, a tease of what's coming in the next couple of weeks. And not with wisdom and eloquence. So remember, in their culture, it was assumed that if you were wise, like a philosopher, you would be a gifted speaker. You'd be trained in rhetoric. And, and so if you're, if you're not like a gifted speaker, then there'd be questions, how, how wise are you? You see, they go together. And so what Paul is gonna be saying here in, in the next couple of weeks is that when he came, he, he didn't rely on, on rhetoric. He, he just shared the, the message, the radical message, the offensive message of Christ in him crucified. And he trusted that God will work supernaturally to draw people to him. And so he says, um, not in wisdom or eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And he'll talk more about what he means by that in the next two weeks. But so, so that's our passage for today. As Paul jumps into the deep end and takes on, hey, I, I've heard it through the grapevine that what's going on there, you're, you're splitting up over leaders. This is horrible. Um, and, and so uh, let, let's talk about this. And so for the next four chapters, this is going to be the issue that he deals with until we get to 
chapter five. But of course, along the way, it's gonna get so much important teaching about what it means to be a follower of Jesus and to leave their culture behind and to follow, follow Christ. But what I wanna do today in the time that we have together is I, I wanna just, this, uh, just highlight one key principle that flows out of this passage that's so critical for us to understand as followers of Jesus and, and also is sort of a benchmark to measure our own spiritual maturity. Remember last week we talked about this, how do you measure your spirituality? Well, today we're gonna to see one of the primary ways to, to measure it. Um, and so, so we'll start by laying out the principle and then we'll come back and, and we'll ask a question. So here we go. So this first principle is gonna be very simple, but it's extremely profound and it goes to the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, it's something that Jesus taught, uh, it's something that why, why Paul is so big on it, and it goes like this, that unity is a top priority. So what we're gonna see today, and this is nothing new for those of you who've been at Rocky Peak uh, a long time, but what we're gonna see today is that in the body of Christ, there, there are certain, there are primary issues. There are things as followers of Jesus, we, we never compromise, right? Uh, who Jesus is, you know, who God is, our, our path to faith, the authorities of scripture and things like that. Uh, and, and then there's secondary issues that are important issues, but they're not crucial to our faith. And, and what we're gonna see, and this is gonna come out in this letter later on when we get to chapters eight through 10, is that in these secondary issues that are extremely important but not, uh, but not primary, um, that in these areas that the uh, mark of our maturity is that we learn to love and accept one another even when we disagree on these uh, kind of uh, important but secondary issues. And, and so this is gonna become a major theme in this entire letter is the priority of unity. Remember what Jesus said in our last series, in John 17, the last night that he was uh, praying before he was arrested. Remember he said, he said uh, Father, I pray that they might be one, even as you and I are one, so the world may know that you sent me. This was a top priority for Jesus. And we're gonna see today, it's a top priority for the Apostle Paul. In fact, it's such, a, it's such an important theme in this letter that there in your note sheet, uh, the first verse is 1 Corinthians verse 10. Many scholars, and I, I don't necessarily agree with this, but many scholars believe that this is sort of the theme verse for the entire letter. Uh, now, I, I'm not sure I could go that far, but just by the fact that many scholars believe that uh, tells you how important this passage is. And so let's look at it. So he says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, uh, this is in the name of King Jesus. He's coming as an apostle in the name of Jesus that you all agree with one another in what you say, that there'll be no divisions among you. You'll be perfectly united in mind and thought. And as I mentioned earlier, that he doesn't mean that they're gonna agree on every single issue. It's gonna be very clear when we get to chapters eight through 10 of what to do when we don't agree. All right, so um, on kind of these secondary issues. Um, and so I want you to catch this, that unity does not mean uniformity, all right? So if you're like in a life group and you have life group members who have difference of opinion on important issues, uh, maybe spiritual gifts, uh, maybe it's women in ministry. Uh, maybe it's style of worship. Uh, maybe it's some of the issues that have rocked our culture we'll talk about later. COVID or how to respond or vaccines or, or Black Lives Matter or racial issues or defunding the police or whatever. That, that these are important, very important issues that we need to be discussing as followers of Jesus. But what we're gonna see uh, is that there's, there's room for disagreement in the body and these secondary issues, uh, but that so, so unity is a priority, but unity doesn't mean uniformity, all right? Now, uh, what we're also gonna see today is the value that we place on unity reveals our level of maturity. And let me just say this, I, I think that for some of us here today, this is gonna be a very challenging message. 
I, I think when we talk about, hey, the, the way of culture and the way of Christ, and, and when I've announced to you that this, this series is gonna be challenging, the chances are our mind goes to things uh, like sexuality issues, or our mind uh, goes to things, maybe political issues or whatever. And they're definitely, those will come up later. Those definitely will come up. But, but what I want you to catch is right here at the outset, this is gonna be one that we're probably all impacted by, is, is how high a value do you place on the unity of the body versus the priority you place on your opinions on secondary issues? Are you with me? And so all of a sudden, we're ready to get those people out there and all of a sudden, Paul, Paul starts with a topic that has us looking hard at within. Okay? And so, uh, now this is interesting because as I mentioned before, the reason the Corinthians were fighting and dividing over these issues is really goes to pride and ego. That they needed to show that they were the smart ones, that they were the best ones, they're the most spiritual ones. In fact, when we get to 1 Corinthians 11, look what it says there on your note sheet, the next verse down. Uh, Paul's talking, and he's very sarcastic in this verse. And I always love that, because I, I believe sarcasm is a spiritual gift. <laughs> and um, so whenever I see him being sarcastic, it's like, you go for it, brother. But, but look what he says in chapter 11. He says, I hear that when you come together, Mer catch it, I hear, this is very likely coming from Chloe's visit as well the household. I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. Uh, yeah, and actually, it's no surprise. And he said, no doubt, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. <laughs> like, yeah, of course, we got to separate and divide to show who's God's favorite kids, and who's the smartest, and who's the most spiritual. Look down, I think it's four passages. You've got several passages. Look down four passages. This is one that we looked at, we've looked at every week of this series, but you'll, it, it'll come into focus even more clearly now. And when he gets to chapter three, he says, brothers and sisters, see that first, first Corinthians three? He says, I, I couldn't address you as people who catch us live by the spirit, or spiritual people, people following the spirit, but as people who are still worldly, Right, and remember in the culture, in the Greek it says those who are fleshly, and that'll become important in just a second. You're, you're mere infants, you're like toddlers in Christ. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not acting like mere humans? You're acting just like the culture around you. You're acting just like everyone else. I mean, if you've ever worked in a job outside your home. If you've ever been in a marketplace, you know how this goes. Like every place you go, there's always dissensions, there's always backbiting, there's always factions, right? It's just, it's how the world rolls. And he says, you're, you're acting just like your culture, right? just like you did before you came to Jesus. And then he says, for when one says, I follow Paul, or I am of Paul, I'm, I'm on team Paul, and another, I'm on team Apollos, are you not acting like human beings? And here's what I want you to catch. One of the marks of the flesh, our lower human nature with its magnetic pull to the dark side, one of the marks is dissension. And I want, I want you to see this. I want you to take your Bibles, and, and this, you know, this was kind of a late ad. So let's go to Galatians, the letter of Galatians, chapter five in your Bibles. Remember last week we looked at this passage, we talked about the fruit of the spirit. What does true maturity look like? Well, today let's look at the opposite side. In chapter five, uh, Paul's talking about the acts of the flesh. Like, what does it look like to follow the flesh in our life? And so he says in verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious, and he starts with you know, some of our usual suspects. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. But then he switches to relational issues. Well, what does it look like when we're walking in the flesh in terms of our relationships? He says it looks like this. It looks like hatred. It looks like discord. 
It looks like jealousy. We just read that in Corinthians. It looks like fits of rage. It looks like selfish ambition. We'll see that later today. It looks like dissensions. It looks like factions. This is the way the world rolls. This is the way we roll before we come to Jesus. But, but Paul is saying, hey, one of the marks of spiritual maturity is that we are, we're, we're now valuing a relationship. We're valuing uh, the, and making unity a top priority. And, and this is a great measure for how mature you really are. Let me give you another example. Uh, one, of the, one of the words that Paul often uses in his teaching is the word worthy. And so he often calls us as followers of Jesus to live lives that are worthy of the gospel. Or he'll call us to, to live lives that are worthy of your calling or worthy of the Lord, right? So the question is, well, what does it look like to live a life worthy of the Lord? Now, let's, let's, kind of, like, let's pretend we hadn't had this talk today. We hadn't been here together. And if I were to, hear, to ask you, hey, when you hear Paul say that, live a life worthy of the gospel, or worthy of the Lord, or worthy of your high calling, like what comes to your mind, right? Right away, what would it look like to live a life worthy of the gospel? And my hunch is that for many of us, our first thing we, we, we would go to would, would be maybe certain sins or, or kind of things we need to leave behind. And so to live our life worthy, of the, maybe, hey, we, we, leave, we leave sexual immorality behind. We, we leave lying behind. We leave stealing behind. We, we kind of clean up our language. We no longer use language in abusive ways. And these kinds of, we, we stop our, our partying and our drunkenness and abusing alcohol or, or, or substances. And so for a lot of us, that might be the first thing. And let me be very clear, that's definitely part of living a well, life worthy. Uh, I think for others of us, it might go a different direction. It might come to positive things that we, we should be doing as followers of Jesus. Well, hey, we're going to church, we're reading our Bible, we're in community, we're, we're, serving, uh, we're serving with our gifts, we're giving generously, you know, we're uh, practicing spiritual. And of course, this too is part of what it means to be worthy. But what's really interesting, and one of the things that the Lord is just kind of bringing me back to time and time again the last couple of years, is that when Paul talks about living a life worthy of the gospel, that he often, the very first thing he talks about is preserving unity of the body. Like something that, that wouldn't have been natural for me to think of, hey, that's number one, you know? But I want to give you a couple examples of this. So uh, there in your note sheet, you go up again to find Philippians 1. And so in Philippians 1, uh, what's going on is that the Apostle Paul is, uh, he's in prison. He's writing to the church at Philippi. Uh, Paul is not sure if he's going to be executed or released. They're experiencing significant persecution. On top of that, there's some growing interpersonal tensions in the church. And so in chapter one, he says, uh, he says so whatever happens, okay, whatever happens to me, whether I'm executed or released, conduct yourselves in a manner, what's the next word? Okay, circle that, all right? This is our topic on the table. What does it look like to live a life worthy? Worthy of the gospel. He said, then whether I come and see you, you know, like I'm released from prison, or I hear about you in my absence, you know, I'm still in jail, um, I will know that you stand firm, catch this, in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. And then as he crosses over into chapter two, he talks about what, is that, what does that look like and to, to live a life worthy. He says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and mind. And so Paul says, as you're there in Philippi, it's so important that as a, a church that you're united, it's one spirit, um, we're speaking with one voice. Uh, as you, you stand up there, you stand for Jesus in the midst of a, a violent culture, it, it's so important you're united. So live a life worthy of the gospel. Right? Okay. Second passage is the next one in your note sheet, Ephesians 4. So in Ephesians, the first three chapters, Paul is laying out this epic vision of God uh, for, for all creation. And a big part of that vision he talks about in chapter two and three about how God's vision from before time was to create one new community, one new uh, body of believers that will rule with him forever uh, in which all the old, all the old uh, 
all the old divisions of the human race are broken down, especially in that passage between Jew and Gentile. And so after he lays out this epic vision, he challenges him uh, in chapter four, he begins to get practical. What does it look like then to live out this epic vision? So he says, as a prisoner for the Lord, so once again, he's in prison, I urge you, that's that same word later that was earlier in First Corinthians 1, I appeal to you, same word. I, I urge you to live a life, what does he say next? Worthy, worthy. okay, circle it. Wor- worthy of the calling. Okay, so what does it look like, Paul, to live a life worthy? Well, look what he says next. He says, it's about how you do your relationships. He says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. And then I love this one, bearing with one another in love. Let me ask you something. When do you have to bear with someone? (laughs) When they're very irritated. (laughs) Right? Like, you don't have to bear with your best friend you always get along with. Just, hey, bear with them. Well, there's no bearing. It's just all joy, right? But hey, you're in a life group and someone is being really irritating, <laughs> right? Someone's really frustrating. They're dropping the ball in major ways. Like they were supposed to bring dessert for the potluck <laughs> and they brought fruit. You know, <laughs> you know, it's like, come on, dessert, you know? Small caps, chocolate. That's like, like that's what we do here, you know? It's, it, no, no, no. It's like, no, sliced kiwi is not dessert, right? <laughs> so when do you have to bear with someone? When they're irritating, when they're frustrating, when they let you down, when they don't act like Jesus follower, like what, when they're treating you with disrespect, when they're not listening to your opinion, when they monopolize the conversation, or how about this, when they hold a different point of view on a very important but secondary issue. This is when we have to bear with one another. This is what it looks like to live a worthy life. Paul says to live a worthy life, it's about how we do our relationships, especially in the body of Christ. Being, living a worthy life is being humble. It's being gentle. No, 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 let me, being completely humble and gentle. It's about bearing with those who let you down, who disagree on important but secondary issues. He says, bearing with one another in love. And then what he says, he says, make every effort. And I won't go into all the Greek word, but let me tell you, it's a word that deals with passion and zeal. And that's why they translate it. Make every effort, flat out, go for it. To keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Like, like fight for the peace. And and with with other believers, fight for that peace. Make every effort to protect that that unity of the Spirit. So, well, what is he talking about, this unity of the Spirit? Well, he goes on in the very next verse to talk about what he's talking about. And I separated there because I didn't want you to cheat and go ahead. But he's going to list here seven or eight things. I would call them seven, but some might call it eight. Seven things that we share as follow, like if you're a follower of Jesus, you share this with every other follower of Jesus, regardless of the other side of a political aisle or a, an important issue. This is what we share. He says there is one body, in other words, one new community of the king. There's one spirit, in other words, that, that we've all received the same spirit of Jesus that we were, every one of us is a temple of the Holy Spirit, as Paul will say later in this letter, that we were called to one hope. He's talking about this future, the next life, the new heavens and the new earth. We have one Lord. There, there's one, one ruler of our lives that we all salute. We all bow the knee. We, we all report to the same king. There's one faith, talking about this, the common, like the core primary issue of the faith, you know, of who Jesus is, who we are, how our relationship with God works through faith. Uh, one baptism, we've talked about, it. We've, we've all shared in the same baptism into Jesus, into his death and his resurrection. And then we all share one God, 
who's the father of all, over all, and through all. So, so Paul says, hey, hey, remember who you are. I've shared this vision that God has for this new world that's coming and for this, this kingdom, and you're all part of it, where the divisions are broken down. He says, so you know, what does it look like to live a life worthy of that calling? He says, well, it, it starts relationally. It's, it's embracing humility. It's embracing uh, uh, patience. It's embracing forgiveness. It's bearing with one another. It's, it's like making every effort to protect the unity of the spirit because this is what we share in common. We're one community of the king. We've all share the same Holy Spirit. We've all been born again of the same Holy Spirit. We all bow the knee to the same Lord. We've got one God who's over all. We've all been baptized. We share the same faith. Brothers and sisters, we are one. What unites us is bigger than what separates us. So fight for the unity of the body. Amen. Amen. And so, the quest, so this leads to a very important question. And again, this may be challenging for some of us here. Um, it, it may challenge some of your paradigms of what it means to be a mature believer in Jesus, just like it challenged the Corinthians last, last week, like Paul challenged them. But I'd ask you to try to keep an open mind, and I would ask you, all I'm asking is, let this be your authority. All right? I'm saying, if any of what I'm about to say irritates you, <laughs> would you please just keep an open mind? And would you just, would you just say, okay, is that what Jesus said? Is that what the New Testament says, right? Because the Corinthians thought they were mature when they were super immature. And the reason is they weren't submitting to the teaching that Paul was giving them. They, they were following the way of their culture, thinking they were following the way of Christ and actually very proud about it. And Paul is calling them back and saying, no, no, no. We come back to the cross. We come back to the message of Christ. You need to stop following the way of your culture. And for some of us, it's the same call. That we may see ourselves as very wise or very courageous or very brave or the true believers because we're willing to fight other Christians on these issues. And for some of us, we're gonna to need to look hard and just say, hey, is that really true? Is it possible that the way I'm measuring my maturity is different than how Jesus sees it? And so I, I would just pray that we would all approach this with just a real humility and openness to the Holy Spirit to see what the word of God is saying. And so there in your note sheet, you have a section on Christ, culture, and the church, the key question. And let me, let me ask the question and then begin to unpack it for you. But the question goes like this. Are you a source of conflict or a force for unity? And I'm talking especially in the body of Christ. This would, this would apply certainly outside. It's not like we lose our humility when we deal with non-believers, right? Um, like, okay, I'm, I'm with non-believers now. I can be really proud and arrogant. Um, yeah. It's like, no, but, but we're going we're to start today with the body of Christ because that is the topic on the table. And so the question is, would you see yourself, uh, maybe here's a helpful way to ask it, would those who know you best, you know, spouse, close friends, family members, would they see you as a source of conflict or a force for unity? You know, as we go through life, all of us carry two buckets, one is a bucket of gasoline, and one is a bucket of water. And when there's conflict in the, in the body of Christ, when there's conflict, it doesn't matter, it's in your life group, in the church at Rocky Peak, or the church of Jesus at, at large, that as we go through life, we all have two buckets, a bucket of gasoline, and a bucket of water. And, and when we come across conflict, right, whether it's, on, whether it's uh, on, on social media or whether it's in our life group or whether it's in our friend circle or within our church or our ministry team, that we all have to choose, do I, do I take the gasoline and throw it on this? 
and say, she said that? Let me tell you what she said to me. Uh, or, yes, can you believe that? I can't even believe they call themselves Christians. We all well, decide, do we throw gasoline on the fire or do we throw water on the fire and, and try to help bring that discussion back towards a place of unity? Like Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for they'll be called children of God. And so the question is, in, in your life, and especially in these really important but secondary issues, and before we get into that, let me just say this, is that I want to be very clear that some of these issues that have torn churches apart, torn our culture apart, are really important issues, extremely important. And as Christians, we need to be dialoguing and discussing them. And we need to be bringing under the authority of Scripture and saying, hey, as followers of Jesus, what should be our position on that? And, and, but in order to do that, we need to be able to dialogue within the body of Christ with kindness and with respect, passion at times, but, but never like bitterness, never writing each other off, not attacking. Because whenever we do that, we're doing exactly what the Bible tells us not to do that we're making secondary issues more important than primary and we're separating the body of Christ for which Christ died. So the question would be, you know, as you look back over your life, especially the last two or three years, would you be seen more as a source of conflict or a force for unity? And I I think this is all, for all of us, myself included, something, it's a great question to ask. You know, the last few years have been the most divisive years in our culture that I've ever seen. Um, The only thing I can compare it with at all would be the Vietnam War years. And for those who are alive then, or for those who have seen it on Discovery Channel, uh, you can remember there there was a lot of violence. There was a lot of, it was a very scary time. Um, But I, I think that the level of disunity and division that we're experiencing now goes much deeper even than that. And what we've seen in our culture is exactly what we saw in Galatians chapter five. Hatred, jealousy, attacks, dissensions, factions. What we've seen is our culture has become increasingly violent, both verbally and physically in the last few years. And we've We've lost our respect for truth, for sure. That it doesn't matter what side of the issue is. It it seems like there's a disregard for facts and truth in order to seek solutions. It's, It's as if our narrative, whatever our narrative is, that our narrative is so important that I can never admit anything that doesn't fit in the narrative for fear that I will lose the battle. And so I will compromise the truth I will twist in arguments. I will do whatever it takes because my cause is worth it. I may have to lie in the short run to promote truth and to to promote the right side in in the long run. And we've seen our culture do this. We've seen our culture descend into cancel culture where where you can't can't even disagree on an issue or you'll be canceled. You'll be essentially eliminated from the discussion. And that's what we see in our culture, and I'm sure it's deeply distressing for you as it's deeply distressing for me, but here's what's more distressing for me. What's more distressing is that many times the church of Jesus is responding in very similar ways as our culture. What we've seen is that, remember that first week I said the problem was not that the church was in Corinth. The problem is there's too much of Corinth in the church. And men and women, this is a great example of this. We've seen the way in the last two or three years of these very important but secondary issues, we've watched how Christians have attacked one another, divided from one another, pastors attacking one another, churches attacking one another. Because we we seem to believe that these issues are so important, they're more important than our unity in the spirit. And yet the reality is, by, Jesus said, by this, 
all men will know you're my disciples by the love. So by this, the world will know that the Father sent me by your unity. And so my question for you is, is how would you score yourself on this question? Are you a source of conflict or a force of unity? Th- think of some of the, the key issues that have torn our culture apart and often torn churches apart. Think, for example, of the response to COVID. Like, what's an appropriate level of governmental response? Uh, think about vaccines, good, bad, or otherwise. Um, Think about lockdowns. Think about mask policy. Think about churches, whether churches should meet and defy the government or not meet and honor the government or for whatever reasons, not not meet. Um, Think about racial issues. Think about Black Lives Matter. Think about defunding the police. Think about supporting the police. Think about critical race theory. I I hope you're hearing me on this. These are extremely important issues. And if you were to talk to me personally, I have very strong opinions on most of them. But what my Bible tells me is that if you're my brother in Christ, if you're my sister in Christ, and we're in the same life group, and you have an opinion that's the opposite of mine, and I am convinced you're dead wrong, because often in secondary issues there are rights and wrong. Paul Paul will say that. But what my Bible tells me is that I cannot wait to love and accept you until you agree with me. What my Bible tells me is this is a mark of maturity. The mark of maturity is preserving the unity of the body as our top priority in secondary issues. And so men and women, I think that this calls for a lot of humility on our part because I'm sure we've all been there. Maybe not all, but probably most of us, myself and Clea, have been there at times in this last couple of years. And sometimes it's just broken my heart as I'll read things on social media the believers and often believers in this church and the way we have sometimes responded and denigrated and reviled and catches all in front of non-believers. And we have drug the name of Jesus through the mud. The one who died for our reconciliation. The one who died to create a new community of love. And we have often spit in his face and said, no, my opinion on this issue is more important than loving my brother or sister in Christ. And I will not love them. I will revile them. I will attack them. And I will do it publicly. And then I just think that, that it's a time. This is a time for repentance. This is a time to realize that often we're doing this and we're bragging about it. We see ourselves as being the right ones. We're standing up for truth. We're we're the courageous ones. We're the wise ones. And I think the Apostle Paul would say, I cannot speak to you as spiritual men and women because when there is jealousy and division, are you not acting like mere human beings? Are you not following? And so this is a... This is not meant to, at all in any way like a shaming thing. It's funny, I was talking with someone recently and said, hey, when you're preaching, when you're teaching, do you look at certain people around the room? <laughs> and I said, well, in general, no. Uh, I said, but the, there are certain times when I'm talking about something that's really heated or really, it's getting pretty, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, at that time, I just keep my eyes moving the whole time. (laughs) Because I don't want anyone to feel like, hey, I'm singling you out, or I've got an agenda, or 
hey, I'm really mad at five people and I'm just talking, I'm using a sermon to get at you, right? <laughs> it's like, that's not fair. That's not Jesus. That's not right. No, it's not. Men and women, we're a body here. We're a body here. We, we love one another. And if we have erred and if we have sinned, it's okay. We just need to confess it. We need to embrace it. We need to stop defending it. And we need to recognize that Jesus was, was really clear on this. He was really clear on this. And so when it comes to these secondary issues, will you walk the way of the culture or the way of Christ? You know, it's interesting. Earlier today, we looked at this passage in Philippians 1. Remember where Paul's talked about being worthy of the gospel, and then he, as he moves into chapter 2, talks about what it looks like. And it's so interesting because he continues in chapter two to describe what it looks like to live a life worthy. And you know where he ends up? He ends up with Jesus on the cross as the ultimate model of what it looks like to live a life that's worthy. And there in your note sheet, he says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. We read that before. Then he goes on, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. That's exactly what the the, uh, Corinthians were doing. Um, Said, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each to the interests of others. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ. So do your relationships in your community like Jesus did, and then And then look what what he said. Here's Jesus, the model, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross." Do you see what Paul is saying? He said, in your community, this is the way you live a worthy life. You follow the way of Jesus as best illustrated on the cross. So let me ask you something. You know, for this series, we put this cross up here. And the question I have for you is, what do you see when you look at the cross? I think for many of us, we we often tend, and I mentioned this the first week, that we often tend to look back to the cross, right? This is the place where Jesus was nailed so that we could be forgiven, we could receive atonement, that our relationship with God could be restored, we could enter into this new life, that he'd be able to pour out his spirit on us, that we could become the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we look back to the cross as the place of atonement. And of course, of course it's that, right? It's like absolutely it's that. But one of the things I shared with you the very first week is is the cross is not just calling us to look back and remember, the cross is pointing the way forward. And so when we look at this cross in this series, here's what I want you to know, that when we're in a relationship with brothers and sisters in in Christ, the cross says this is the way you do relationship. Do relationship the way I did relationship. So be completely humble, Be gentle, have great patience with one, bear with one another, that's the way of the cross, the one who bore with us. Um, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but see one another as better than yourself. And when we get to chapter, uh, later on in this series, we, we talk more about secondary, primary and secondary, Paul will say in Romans 15, another famous passage, He'll say, we who are strong, in other words, we see things more clearly, spiritually, we have more truth, ought to catch, bear with the weaknesses of the weak. Those who don't think, see things spiritually as clearly. That, that, that's the calling of a strong spiritual person to bear with. To not say, I'll love you when you finally get it right and agree with me. But to say, I'll love you even if you're wrong on a very important issue because it's in this environment of love that we can actually discuss and learn and grow together. And then Paul says, after saying that, he says, this is what Jesus did on the cross. He bore with our offenses, right? 
So, so the way of the cross is not something we just look back to. The way of the cross should be tattooed on every one of our, our chests. This, this is our way forward. The way, the, way of the, cro- the way forward is always the way of the cross. The way of relationship is always the way of the cross. And my hope is in this series that, that we would begin to see the cross in new eyes. That, that we would look back to what Jesus did, but we would look forward of the model he's giving for us. That this is the way of culture. The way of culture is division, factions, and hatred. The way of the cross is gentleness, patience, humility, forgiveness, putting one another's needs above our own, of giving up the right to be right, giving up the right to be seen as right, that you don't have to say I'm right before I love you, that's the way of the cross. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, boy, we come to some challenging things, and I'm sure for many of us, this is a surprise. You know, we think about talking about culture and and how we're influenced by culture. We were not expecting this, but the reality is, Lord, so many times, in times of conflict, we, we would just more reflect the culture than really reflect the cross. And so, Lord, we pray that you would forgive us. We pray that as we come before you, as we recognize this, as we say, maybe I'm not as mature as I, I thought, and I, I need to embrace a new way. I pray that for your grace, we pray for your forgiveness. And as we sing this song, Lord, that, that just contrasts kind of these first, this, the message of 1 Corinthians, right? The, the wisdom of the world versus the truth of the cross as we pray for you and ask you to build your church. We pray you'd hear our cry, you'd you'd hear our apologies, and you, you would give us grace to rise with you, to die to the old and rise with you to the new. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.